So let's look at food choices and disgust. So reviewing those elicitors of disgust that all human cultures find disgusting, we see, again, things that are moist, slimy, wet, soft, sticky, greasy, oily, squishy, putrid, and foul. Things that are asymmetric, amorphous in their shape, things covered with flies, blood, uh, things that are decaying or rotting, uh, things that are uh, uh, surrounded by animal effluent or covered with hair and fur, things that are gory and covered with worms and maggots. All right. So let's first look at things that are bloody, gory, and uh, filled with violence. Well, it turns out that human beings uh, are also born with what's called the blood uh, injury phobia. It has long been recognized that humans have an innate aversion uh, that is disgust response to the sight of blood and dismemberment. Over 500 years ago, Shakespeare wrote, many will swoon, that is faint, when they do see blood. That's from his play, As You Like It. Lightheadedness or fainting at the sight of blood and dismemberment is equally common in both men and women. And as uh, someone who's gone through medical school, I can tell you, um, the men would almost pass out more uh, often and quickly than the women. Um, And as she says, you think? Uh, (laughs) Studies show that this loss of consciousness or lightheadedness is the result of a central nervous system reflex that causes a drop in heart rate and blood pressure that leads to decreased perfusion of the brain. And that is what uh, causes the fainting. Research has shown that this uh, CNS-mediated decrease in heart rate and blood pressure upon seeing blood violence and or injury is present from an early age and is therefore believed to be the normal response for human beings. So in other words, this is not something that someone taught us. This is not something we had to learn. This is, we're all born with this, that when we see blood, we are uh, um, uh, repulsed by it. And it it makes us like kind of lightheaded and nauseous and, 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 and uh, um, uh, want to, to, to turn away from it. Is there any scientific data to support that view? Well, of course there is. And this is from a study uh, called the effect of muscular reactivity as evidenced by flow mediated dilation. Um, I wanna give credit to Dr. Jeffrey Novick, um, brilliant uh, nutritionist. Uh, he shared this uh, slide with me um, and it uh, came from a study where uh, they showed a group of volunteers, two movies. One of them is a comedy called Kingpin, starring Woody Harrelson, who happens to be vegan, by the way. And the other uh, was the movie Saving Private Ryan, which if you've ever seen that movie, you know it is extremely violent and graphic in terms of the type of carnage that it showed. And uh, they measured the... um, vascular reactivity in the um, people watching the movie um, and and showed what happened in the blood flow in their vest, blood vessels as uh, they watched these movies and afterwards. And this is what they found, that pre and post laughter in, uh, um, after watching the comedy, for the vast majority of the individuals watching the comedy, the um, amount of blood flowing through their arteries increased by an average of 22%. Now, if you look, there was this one individual who um, his uh, blood flow actually decreased from watching a comedy, and that guy might be a future serial killer. I don't know. Um, But um, (laughs) for the people who watch the watch the very distressing and anguish producing um, uh, Saving Private Ryan, blood flow decreased by an average of 35%. Again, except for, if you look towards the top, there's one person whose blood flow shot up after watching all of that violence and and, 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 uh, gore and, 
Um, they should have reported him to the authorities, but anyway. Um, but you can see in general, human beings are put off and repulsed um, by uh, uh, violence and gore and um, um, whereas uh, laughter and, and happiness uh, increases uh, our blood flow. The reasons for the uh, presence of this blood injury phobia reflex have been extensively debated. Some people have suggested that it developed as a way of warding off predation by allegedly playing dead. However, playing dead is not an effective way to ward off predation since a dead bleeding victim is exactly the result a predator is trying to achieve especially African savanna predators. And that would be important since it's believed that human beings uh, first appeared on the African savanna. Um, and uh, when um, uh, newborn fawns um, are um, left by their mothers to lie motionless on the African savanna, they are not playing dead. These um, uh, newborn fawns are actually born without any scent whatsoever. And so when they are laying motionless, what they are do actually doing is mimicking an inert object. They are basically pretending to be like a rock out there on the savanna. Um, and that's why they don't have any smell. And I told you earlier that carnivores don't have, uh, their eyes are not able to see detail very well. And so as long as that baby fawn doesn't move, if the carnivore can't smell them, they literally cannot differentiate them from the background uh, gravel, rocks, and um, grass on the savanna. And there are um, many, many uh, uh, um, filmed scenes of uh, lions and hyenas walking right past uh, baby animals that held their nerve and didn't get up and run uh, because they could not smell them. They could not uh, uh, detect them um, from the uh, uh, surrounding uh, uh, vegetation and uh, uh, other, uh, I, uh, you know, background uh, items on the savanna. So that is the, the, the purpose of them uh, um, laying motionless. It's not playing dead. It's just so they won't be detected. The sight and smell of blood are stimulatory to carnivores and will spur them to begin feeding once their prey has stopped moving. So if an animal, if a carnivore is trying to kill you and eat you, playing dead is not going to work. Looking like food will not deter a carnivore bent on obtaining a meal. If playing dead ever works, it usually only works in cases where an animal is seeking to protect its young from a perceived threat. And that is um, uh, what I... Uh, uh, hope to get across from this Farsight cartoon um, where the Anderson brothers foolishly were playing with this bear cub. And you can see the mother is about to make short work of the Anderson brothers. And it reads, and no one ever heard from the Anderson brothers again. And so if you are in a situation where um, you come between, say, a mother bear and her cubs, and she attacks because she perceives you perceives you as a threat to those cubs. In that case, if you um, drop to the ground, cover up and uh, adopt a defensive posture, stop moving, and she no longer perceives you as a threat, then she may very well walk away and leave you alone. And there are cases where that's, that has happened. Um, but if a bear attacks you, because they're hungry and want to eat you, playing dead will only get you actually dead. A more likely reason for the existence of the blood injury phobia reflex is to serve as a break um, on the interpersonal conflict in a social species that does not have instinctual ritualized behaviors that regulate and limit such conflicts. Unlike um, most large social mammals, which have ritualized inborn uh, behaviors such as, um, um, you know, and, and instinctual postures and, and so forth that they adopt towards one another to kind of um, figure out who's the top animal and uh, 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 settle their, their, their um, um, dominance hierarchy, 
human beings really don't have those kind of instinctual behaviors. So, but that lack of, of, of uh, in, uh, instinctual behaviors also allows us a lot of cultural flexibility. But we do need some kind of mechanism to keep us from killing each other. And as a result, we have the blood injury phobia uh, blood injury phobia reflex. The, adapt the adaptive significance of an aversion to the sight of blood or mutilation may involve an evolved natural inhibitory influence that serves to prevent the species from unchecked aggression that could lead to self-destruction. So in other words, if we get into you know, conflict and we start beating the crap out of each other and once we see the sight of blood, we both faint, that keeps us from killing each other. Unfortunately, research and experience have consistently shown that humans can become inured to the sight of blood and our aversion to violence and dismemberment can sadly be overcome by conditioning, training, and socialization. To increase the audience for violence, the vehicle for it is supercharged with the excitement generated by sexual themes and powerful music and given a hard gloss of professionalism enabling the most sordid events to be presented in a brilliant, glittering, ultra-violent light. That's uh, from uh, an article called Vagotonicity of Violence, Biochemical and Cardiac Responses to Violent Films and Television Programs uh, that was published in the British Medical Journal. I forgot to read the citation for the previous uh, uh, quote. Um, this ability to overcome our innate nature has both good and bad aspects. Uh, for example, it's allowed a society to train surgeons, nurses, and paramedics uh, who've been able to save people who've been involved in trauma. But tragically, it has also allowed us to create soldiers, weapons of uh, uh, mass destructions, and sadly, the atrocity of war. And we see evidence of that over uh, in uh, the Ukraine right now. To make war palatable, we use uh, these high-sounding evocative words to convince ourselves about things like virility and honor, glory and valor. And in uh, the uh, most recent incarnations in the United States, things like democracy. But sadly, uh, these words are words that resonate only in the ears of living people. We always seem so naively surprised when war, in fact, proves to be hellish, brutal, cruel, ugly, and often pointless. Again and again, we find the pretty words we use are simply lies we tell our youth to entice them into dying, and they're things we tell ourselves so that we will willingly let our young men and women go to their untimely deaths. <sighs> Why did we dehumanize and animalize others? Simply because it is much easier to kill other people and other beings when we deny their essential sameness and their sentience. And this has happened time and time again throughout history. During the Holocaust, Nazis referred to Jews as rats. Uh, Hutus involved in the Rwanda genocide called um, the Tutsis, which were another of another tribe, cockroaches. Uh, slave owners throughout history considered slaves uh, subhuman animals. Uh, that happened in the United States. In the book Less Than Human, David Livingston Smith argues that it is important to define and describe dehumanization because it is what opens the door for cruelty and genocide. Um, if you've been paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine, Putin has been lying and claiming that the Ukrainians were Nazis, and uh, that's why he has to do what he's doing. Uh, people do much the same thing to the animals. Some choose to eat. Science has, science has shown that animals are sentient. They have feelings and emotions. They also experience grief and loss. And these facts should negate the continued wanton slaughter of our fellow earthlings. Uh, Holocaust survivor Alex Hershaf has made these same connections between the inhumanity humans have shown to other humans and the abuse we visit on other animals. And this is a poster from um, a program he gave in August of 2014. 
Humankind's distaste for blood, bloodletting, and violence is probably why we have created specific professional classes such as soldiers, butchers, and executioners to perform tasks we personally find repellent. But then we leave these people uh, in these uh, you know, professional classes to deal with the post-traumatic stress disorder and, uh, and other negative psychological fallout that stem from violating our intrinsic nature. Turns out 20% of Army troops and 42% of National Guard troops that we sent off to uh, fight in the uh, Middle East war, such as the Iraqi war, came home with new mental uh, illness diagnosis, uh, diagnoses. Rather. Suicides in the deployed National Guard troops were up 82% from 2009 and uh, a whopping 450 uh, percent from 2004. Army suicides doubled between uh, 2001 and 2006, and it looks it turned out that the um, deployments were worse on the National Guard troops than they were on the uh, Army um, uh, infantrymen, and that's very likely because the National Guardsmen were living more of a normal or a life in society and they were kind of snatched out of uh, uh, that normalcy and then suddenly thrust into these war zones, whereas the uh, um, uh, army infantrymen were somewhat more used to being uh, in a uh, 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 infantry setting. But the bottom line is that a blood injury violence phobia reflex could not, absolutely not, exist in a true predator species because it would clearly be maladaptive for a predator to pass out or become lightheaded and nauseous at a point at which it began to kill its prey, right? Uh, so the human aversion to blood, violence, and dismemberment shows that we are clearly not natural predators. Human anatomy, physiology, disease susceptibilities, and our psychology unequivocally demonstrate we are natural herbivores. While blood gore, and gore elicit a strong disgust response in us, no one has ever passed out from watching someone pick and eat an apple. Well, with the possible exception of Adam. He says, miss, oh miss, for God's sake, please stop. Well, let's talk about things that are moist, wet, and slimy. Animal flesh in its unaltered form has many, if not most, of the characteristics all human beings find disgusting. If you were to offer a ragged, squishy, wet, slimy, bloody piece of raw flesh to most humans, they simply would not eat it. But carnivores absolutely love it. If people attempted to eat unpreserved, unbutchered raw flesh without cutlery, many would actually die from choking or food poisoning or parasitic infections. That's especially true if the flesh has actually started to rot, it's putrid and covered with flies, beetles, maggots, and other pathogenic bacteria. The smell of rotting flesh is perceived by humans as a malodorous stench. It induces nausea and actually a retching, vomiting reflex in us that will cause us to throw up whatever we have eaten in an attempt to rid our bodies of dangerous and harmful material. I mean, have you ever thought about why smelling something that is rotting makes you throw up? It's, it's, it's again, because we are a social species, it is the body's way of saying, hey, if you uh, uh, come across something that is rotting, it may be that you had already eaten something that hadn't quite gotten to the point where it started to stink, but you could be uh, in danger. So you might as well get rid of what you've already eaten just to be safe. This is the brain's way of saying, don't even think of trying to eat this stuff. Our innate aversion to raw and putrid animal flesh is a survival mechanism meant to protect us from ingesting things we're not designed to eat and that could kill us by causing us to either choke to death or die from infections caused by pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and parasites. 
Carnivores, by contrast, are actually drawn to decaying flesh, will dine on it for several days with absolutely no ill effects. In fact, during times of war, there have been many unfortunate instances of carnivores digging up and dining on the uh, uh, buried, decomposing corpses of dead soldiers and civilians. Then looking at things that are asymmetric, covered with fur and blood. The reasons we skin, pluck, and drain the blood from uh, animal flesh, flesh and then cut and shape it into the smooth edged, rounded, hand-sized objects is so that it will mimic edible plant parts and thereby circumvent our innate disgust response. We're trying to make this stuff look like plants. Why is smooth, annular, which means rounded, symmetry in food so attractive and important to us? Because asymmetry in plant tissues is usually a sign or signal of disease and hence equates with poor nutritive value. When plants are well watered and receive adequate sunlight, nitrogen and minerals, their tissues and fruits and seed pods are usually very symmetrical and well formed. This symmetry or beauty signals that these items are likely packed with nutrients or health promoting and therefore are more desirable, which is why you don't go to the supermarket and pick the, you know, rotted or brown or uh, uh, diseased looking fruits or the ones that are misshapen and, and, and uh, um, uh, you know, discolored. You want the ones that are perfectly shaped and, and beautifully colored because y your brain is telling you, yeah, that's the one that's going to be most nutritious and taste best. When, when however, plants are stressed by drought, nutrient poor soil, inadequate sunlight, or are infected or infested with insects or fungal parasites, their tissues and products, uh, such as fruits, leaves, seeds, pots, etc., tend to be shrunken, shriveled, misshapen, and discolored, which are signs that these tissues are very likely nutrient deficient. By contrast, true predators actually desire and actually look for asymmetry in their prey. When carnivores go out to hunt, if they see an antelope that has three legs, that's the one they're going to chase. If they see one that, you know, has a tumor growing out the neck, that's the one they're going to chase. Why? Because that one is easier to catch and eat. They don't want the one that's big and robust uh, and that looks the, like it, 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 it uh, has been uh, uh, competing in the WWE because that's the one that's likely to hurt them or either run away from them and they will have wasted their time trying to chase it. So it's a completely opposite uh, uh, type of dynamic. Species survival in nature is fundamentally a question of energy out versus in energy in. If animals spend more, expend more energy procuring their food than they can extract from the food they obtain, they starve to death, cease to exist as a species. For this reason, all true predator species actually seek out ugly food. That is, they desire food that requires a minimum expenditure, expenditure of energy to obtain. This means they will not and do not waste time and energy pursuing the strongest, healthiest, uh, or fittest members of prey species. Instead, they pursue the sick, old, lame, stupid, or very young, and they look for food that is already dead, in other words, carrying it. When they behave in this manner, that ensures they will ultimately strengthen the gene pool of the prey species of their prey species by weeding out the less fit. And by contrast, herbivores seek beautiful food. They want the fresh, verdant, vibrant foliage and fruit because that is the uh, plants. Those are the plants that are most nutritious. When we, because of our herbivore mindset, cull and kill off the most beautiful and robust members of species that we choose to prey on, we actually weaken the gene pool of these species and we drive them to extinction. By contrast, eating and spreading the seeds of the healthiest plants actually help ensure the survival of those particular plant species. Uh, now, what about moist, wet, and squishy? Well, the reason we season and cook flesh is because those manipulations dry it out and give it the firm texture and taste of plants. That's why all the seasonings that we use are actually plants. We cover this dead tissue with uh, plant parts and then cook it to make it firm and have the texture of, of, of plants. Nobody wants a squishy, wet, mushy apple that's rotting. We, we want a firm uh, uh, apple. And, and that's what we do to the animal uh, uh, flesh to make it, you know, firm so that it has that, that texture we want. Cooking is an entirely unnatural behavior. And we can't eat animal tissue 
unless it's cooked in general. So the primary way humans tolerate flesh is by consuming it in an unnatural fashion. This is because we humans have the palate and preferences of an herbivore. We naturally love and crave the taste, textures, colors, and variety of plant foods. Why do we grill, smoke, and barbecue? Well, it's because wood smoke is actually a flavoring that's created when intense heat breaks down plant tissues into some of the same aromatics that are found in true spicings. That's a quote from a book called On Food and Cooking by an author named McGee. Roasting does not sterilize meat. Um, and so the origin and purpose of cooking flesh was not hygienic. It was uh, most likely to impart the taste and texture of plants to animal flesh. People didn't roast animal tissue because it made it sterile. It doesn't make it sterile. Uh, and you find that out every Thanksgiving when people end up in the emergency room from uh, undercooked turkey. And they cook that turkey in a, uh, a stainless steel range that costs a couple thousand dollars. So there's if you can't sterilize turkey in a modern uh, um, gas or electric range, there's no way you're going to sterilize it, burning it up over uh, uh, an open flame on the savannah. But what you will do is make it taste like that wood that you're cooking it over. And, and I'll make it taste a whole lot better than uh, just eating it raw. The spices and herbs we use to flavor meat and fish are all plants, plant parts or derived from plants. In effect, we try to make the meat and fish taste like plants. The spice trade has been a major economic importance throughout human history, and it actually helped spur the age of exploration. Uh, Columbus, with his uh, Dead Sea self, was actually looking for uh, the Spice Islands uh, uh, when he stumbled into the New World. And it turns out only herbivores have a taste for and actually seek out salt. Even when dying from sodium depletion, carnivores will not seek or even eat salt. And they sadly discovered that in the 1950s when they depleted dog chow of sodium and put a little dish of salt right next to the dog chow. The dogs would eat their uh, food every day, never touch the salt, and eventually died from sodium depletion. Whereas for humans, searching for salt has been a major pursuit in every society. Throughout history, salt has been an important and prized commodity. Cities were often founded in places with natural salt formations. The word salary and soldier actually uh, originally meant salt. Our manipulations of animal flesh are all designed to circumvent our disgust reflex. We try to make meat taste and smell like plants by cooking, seasoning, and marinating it in herbs, spices, and other plant products. We give it the texture of plants by bleeding, drying, cooking, and breading, and frying it. Moreover, we make it look like plants by skinning, plucking, cutting, and shaping, and covering it with brightly colored sauces and garnishes. Tests repeatedly show humans uh, uh, often like crispy and crunchy uh, mouthfeel, but these are not the textures of raw animal flesh. I mean, wake up, folks. Mm -hmm.